Dr. Enumnan, uh, can you describe the current issue with citrus greening affecting orange trees throughout the country? What is the role of GM technology in helping to fight this devastating disease? Well, as um, Florida industry in particular is being hit by this particular disease, and um, there's, as plant breeders, looking for options as to how we might go about um, trying to solve the issue, and there are several land-grant universities I'm aware of, that Florida and Texas and, and California, all looking at um, both conventional breeding, if that's an option, but also genetic engineering options. And I think that's the power of the technology, is you can bring in a gene from um, another species to enable those trees to be resistant to the citrus greening disease. And, and that's really, I think, the, the opportunity that exists to utilize this technology to develop disease-resistant plants that are able to withstand um, devastating diseases like citrus greening disease or Pierce's disease. And I think many public sector scientists see this as a real opportunity um, to develop plants that are healthier, don't require any pesticidal inputs or anything. It's just basically breeding to make those trees healthier and able to withstand that disease. Thank you very much. I think that's a really important, which this, depending what the application of the genetically engineered crop is, depends on the environmental impacts. For example, the disease-resistant papaya doesn't require any inputs, and, it, it's, and it, it enables those crops to grow. And so I think that you have to look at the application as to whether or not it has an increased or decreased effect on um, pesticide use. And it's it really, it's, it's application-specific and, and location-specific and country-specific. Thank you so much, Doctor. And I, I am from the state of Florida, so I have a real interest. Uh, uh, Ms. Forche, how much fuel does it take to, to plant and harvest your field? I know you, you talked about this a, a little bit. You alluded to it in your statement. How much what? I'm how much fuel, fuel does it take to, uh, to plant and harvest your field? Well, I would say that, um, well, wow, from planting to harvesting, Oh, approximately. Right. I would say, I would say um, approx right now on my farm, we are not tilling the land. We are no-till farming. So we use fuel in our tractor when we plant the crop, which probably for a couple hours of planting, you know, maybe like on an 80-acre farm, would maybe consume about, oh, I would say maybe a quarter of a tank of fuel to maybe half a, you know, tractor tank of fuel. So probably maybe a, um, 75 to 100 gallons there. And then we harvest the crop. I mean, you know, sometimes there does need to be an application um, if there's a weed problem. But um, so I would say um, total from planting to harvesting, um, maybe a couple hundred gallon where before, if we were having to work the ground and, you know, really, um, you know, put strain on our tractors and equipment, it would double, if not, you know, triple that fuel consumption. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Faber, uh, if genetic modification were the only way to fight a particular disease, would the environmental working group still oppose this type of technology? Thank you for the question. Uh, we do not oppose genetic engineering, genetic, genetically modified food ingredients. We think there are actually many promising applications of genetically modified food ingredients. Uh, Dr. Van Anneman mentioned, mentioned several of them. This isn't a question about the technology, this question of whether or not to require labeling. It's really a question of transparency. Should people have this information to make their own choices for their own families. Uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist. I am, I'm optimistic that the promises that were made by the providers of this technology will ultimately be realized, that we'll have traits that are, produce more nutritious food, that we'll see significant yield increases. We haven't, all of those promises haven't yet been realized. But that's not what's at, at stake here in this question of whether or not to preempt Act 120 or whether or not to craft a national disclosure system, the real issue is, should people have the right to decide for themselves? And does FDA have the authority now, I, I believe they do, uh, to, to work with us to craft some kind of informative, fact-based, non-judgmental disclosure on the back of the package? Okay, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. 